Beautiful. Beautiful. With it's okay. Um, da -da 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 -da. Hang on, I gotta take a photograph of myself. So. Welcome back to Studio B. Thank you very much for being here. We've made it to week nine. I'm gonna start this again because I am, I don't really know what I'm saying today. It's been that kind of week, but you know what? Welcome anyway. We're just gonna keep on because this is one take news. This is authentic intelligence. Here's something, and for those of you who do listen to Radio Fly, you know that I say all the things. So here's something I didn't think I would ever be saying, but I agree with Elon Musk. <gasps> dun, 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 from BBC News. Elon Musk, I will say what I want, even if it costs me. Twitter owner Elon Musk has defended his controversial social media presence, saying he will say what I want, even if it loses him money. Mr. Musk was responding to accusations of anti-Semitism on Twitter. The tweet was seen as playing into frequently debunked conspiracy theories about a Jewish philanthropist. Musk told CNBC he held no anti-Semitic views. He also used the interview to call working from home morally wrong and criticized technology rival OpenAI. Oh, sure. The creators of the monsters are always the first to distance themselves. Hey, I think I've got a good catchphrase. Hello, Mirthlings. Speaking of which, Earthlings, um, from the Guardian, Pacific Islands warned of possible small tsunamis after earthquake near New Caledonia. People across the South Pacific have been told to avoid coastal areas due to the risk of small tsunami waves after a 7.7 .7 magnitude earthquake southeast of the Loyalty Islands in New Caledonia. Tsunami waves ranging from 0.3 to 1 meters above the tide level were possible for some coasts of Vanuatu, the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center said. Waves below that level were set for 25 island groups, including Tonga and Tuvalu. A 22 centimeter tsunami has been observed near New Caledonia. The threat alert added, please stay safe. Let's make the earth move for us with pleasure. Right now, it seems like she wants to shake us off. Time for... Welcome back from Pedestrian TV. New South Wales police reveal why... <laughs> why they tasered a 95 year old woman and uh, as per pedestrians you know irreverent tone it says in the headline and to be honest there's no good reason here and i'm with them <laughs> new south wales police have revealed more information about the 95 year old woman who was tasered twice on wednesday morning in an official statement claire noland was tased by new south wales police and is currently receiving end of life care she is reportedly expected to die and is surrounded by loved ones. Noland was believed to have been making toast with a butter knife in the communal kitchen of her house, or wherever she was living, at 4 a.m., and this was in Cooma, down south, when police were called to apprehend her, a 95-year-old woman. She suffers from dementia and was reportedly tasered while standing next to her walking frame. Or tased, my apologies, that's what's written here. I want to highlight personally and on behalf of the organization, the care and the empathy and the sympathy we feel for the Nolan family, said New South Wales Police Assistant Commissioner Peter Cotter in an official press conference. An independent investigation is underway. We, the police, treat this matter with extreme significance. During the conference, Cotter revealed the knife Nolan was wielding was in fact a steak knife. She was in a room, she did have a knife in her hand, and it is fair to say that she was armed with that knife. Okay, sure, yep, on paper, a woman was armed with a knife. Per Cotter, Nolan refused to drop the knife after she was asked to by police and was then tasered by a senior constable. She remains in a critical condition, he said. What is in a critical condition is the mental state of those who exist to protect. And the time left on these ticking bombs, listen to this. So, we have, from LinkedIn News, Male-dominated boards on notice. Some of Australia's biggest super funds have put male-dominated boards of Australian stock exchange companies on notice and will be pressuring them to elect more female directors. Look, I've had to move on really quickly to this story because the previous story about Nolan, has, the 95-year-old woman tasered by police because she was seen as a threat. Is it? Yeah. 
So we're going back to LinkedIn News, male-dominated boards on notice. You know, I know you don't want emotion from your newsreaders. Well, then you can go to those newsreaders. But here we have feelings in what we're telling, what we're sharing. And this is, I, how can we stand by? How do we allow these things to be the norm? I'm reading the news as if, well, this is just your casual everyday stuff. <laughs> All right, let's go back to this LinkedIn story. I've got to move on. So male dominated boards on notice, news desks too. Some of Australia's biggest super funds have put male dominated boards of Australian stock exchange companies, I know I've already read it, on notice and will be pressuring them to elect more female directors. Peak industry body, Australian Council of Superannuation Investors, has introduced a new policy that requires companies to have at least 30% of women on their boards. At least 30%. The Australian Financial Review reported almost a third of Australian stock exchange companies have less than 30% female directors. A uh, CEO, a female CEO, on, wrote on LinkedIn, 30% women on boards is no longer a target to aspire to, but a minimum expectation. We should actually expect at minimum 50% because, yeah. However, an executive recruiter says initiatives like this could be challenging to implement, and I'm more so with her. If these chairs and boards have yet to see the benefit of diverse thinking by now, what type of environment slash culture will a woman be joining? And that is fact. LinkedIn goes on to ask, the news site, what role can super funds play in improving gender diversity on male-dominated domin boards? Well, let's fire them all. Let's just all get together and say, you are all out. If we actually did that, we can get these people out. It's not that difficult, but we allow them to decide what we can do. And what strategies do you think will be most effective to elevate more women to executive levels? Fire the males. And you can share your thoughts in the comments section on LinkedIn. Link is in our caption. We're going to move on. From Sydney Morning Herald. Does the world's most famous film festival have a serious man problem? Are you noticing a... Uh, pattern of this, the pattern of patriarchy, the problem of it. Does the world's most famous film festival have a problem with men behaving badly? Or more to the point, is its problem that it does not have a problem with men behaving badly at all? And that is the problem. First of all, I do want to say about the Khan Film Festival is one of the, uh, the only two things if I, you know, I'm so anti-establishment of all these things, of all these, you know, wanky pat on the back things, but I do love the red carpets and I would totally go if I was invited to the Met Gala and Khan film industry because have you seen my wardrobe and also my flair? And that's the only reason I'd go. I don't really want to go in to see these movies with this, the likes of Depp starring and then I don't really care about the Met Gala inside. It's all just privileged elite behaving badly. I just want to show my flair and be on with it. Now, back to the article. That's the question prompted by the rapturous response Johnny Depp has received following the screening of his French language movie, Jeanne du Barry, on the opening night of the Cannes Film Festival on Tuesday. Nor was the enthusiasm contained to the cinema I'm skipping ahead. Outside, the crowds landing the croisette screamed at their appreciation for his return. There were no protesters to muddy the waters either. Now, this is what's... Conveniently, the city of Cannes had announced on the weekend that all demonstrations would be banned on public roads for the duration of the festival in order to guarantee public order during an exceptionally big and international event. This reminds me of what happened in Sydney in 2000 around the Olympics time. All of a sudden, there were no homeless people around. And the First Nations people they were no longer around the places where they hang in the city, their places, you know. It was like, and also, the weather was perfect. And this really got us thinking, like, is there a dome? Was there a dome? Anyway, this is uh, going a bit too much into conspiracy theory stuff, but listen to what I'm reading. And <laughs> if it transpires that we have just witnessed the second coming of Jack Sparrow, Ugh. The French film industry's premier showcase is a fitting location for it. Long after accusations of predatory behaviour, or worse, had been levelled against the likes of Polanski, Woody Allen and Gerard Depardieu, who is currently facing a rape charge and has been accused by 13 other women of sexual harassment, these men have been invited back. And I speak a lot about Roman Polanski and also on our, on our episodes of Radio Fly. I'm not going to get into that here, but we will do a deep dive on what people are allowed to forgive in the name of art. And it's all only got to do with white old men. Anyway, festival director Thierry Fremont added he had no concerns about selecting Jean de Barry 
for the prestigious opening night slot, despite the risk of a backlash. And this is what he says, okay? I don't know about the image of Johnny Depp in the US, he said. To tell you the truth, in my life, I only have one rule. It's the freedom of thinking and the freedom of speech and acting within a legal framework. Now that's some white ass privilege if I've ever heard any. Interestingly, uh, Frameau, if that is not Frameau, had vetoed a Woody Allen movie citing negative publicity and he wasn't there for that. So this head in the sand shtick is not sticking. You know, Depp is trending because the pigment-free patriarchy are in pushback mode. <laughs> France amounts to a Hollywood comeback for Depp, even if it does come hot on the heels of a renewed contract, listen to this, with Dior for the fragrance Sauvage, for which the actor is expected to earn US $20 million over three years. You know, put all the Sauvage you want on it, you all Think like the savages you say we are, but you know you are. And besides those ads for, that they have going, I mean, I'm sorry, Depp looks like he stinks. He looks like he jingles and jangles with all these things hanging off him, and he's just got a lot of some sort of grungy, you know, old musty smell happening about him. And that's the guy you're using to Jack Sparrow, who looks like he hasn't had a shower for like three years. And last time he had a shower was because he was, you know, thrown into the water. That's who you people are using to sell your fragrance? All right, from Stockhead Australia, this is what we need. This is what we all need. From Stockhead Australia, Weed Week. Cannabis helps chronic pain and insomnia, and here's what the TGA rules say. Sufferers of chronic pain and insomnia have the most to benefit from consuming marijuana, according to new research published in the Journal of American Medical Association last week. The research shows significant improvements in quality of life for people with those conditions, with the positive effects being largely sustained over time. The analysis was conducted in over 3,000 people in Australia who were prescribed medical cannabis for treating certain eligible conditions. Eight well-being indicators were tested, with patients being asked to rate their wellness on a scale of 0 to 100, <laughs> 0 to high, at different stages of treatment. The eight categories were general health, bodily pain, physical functioning, role limitations, mental health, emotional role limitations, social functioning, and vitality. Results from the survey overwhelmingly showed that marijuana helped with the conditions of patients, while adverse side effects were rarely serious. If you're wondering whether medical cannabis is right for your condition, the TGA advises that your first step is to have a conversation with your doctor. Let me just remind you that this article is from Stockhead Australia, which is to do with companies and the stock exchange. I follow the stock exchange and I trust them for news more than ever because the stock exchange uh, companies and, and news sites, etc., are the ones that are tro totally bringing you the news of the times of the site and the future because you know, today is decided way, way, way ahead, except there's not really much big picture thinking because if there was, medical cannabis would have been implemented and made uh, available for everyone just across the counter at any time. The more you regulate something like this, the less taboo it is. I'm an advocate for medical cannabis and I wish I knew about it for my mother who had ovarian and bowel cancer, then dementia. Uh, my mother didn't want medication because, look, it, interestingly, she was not unwell and the doctors agreed. She had chemo. Um, but just to you know, uh, get on top of it. But she lived with physical pain due to physical trauma. And I would have loved her to have this because she also interestingly um, started smoking as she got older. And this, as the dementia uh, you know, came onto her, doctors said that the nicotine was actually a stimulant for her brain. But she didn't even take paracetamol and I'm like that too. You know, medication has its place. I am pro-medicine, absolutely, because it's science and I am pro-science because science is the magic of this world and medicine really is just taking from what this planet has given us. But I have had reason to see how certain medications affect clarity and it's not right that we're doing this. So medical cannabis is what, is what should be the medication prescribed for depression and anxiety because we've got too much of that happening. Not what it is that gets prescribed now. I'm not going to get into it right now, but I do get why people take what is described because healing takes time and hard work and no one has time and the cost of living takes our focus. We talk a lot about this on Radio Fly plus articles on the Starlander. Let's end this on a, on a high note of another kind. From The Guardian, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny Review. Harrison Ford cracks the whip in taut sequel. 
We all sat down for this movie, hoping for a resurgence comparable to what J.J. Abrams did with The Force Awakens. And if that didn't exactly happen, it still sets up a story tearing, telling gallop. Phoebe Waller-Bridge, look, Indiana is going past, <laughs> has a tremendous co-star turn as Indy's roguish goddaughter, Helena Shaw, who wears shorts and shirt, making her look like a grown-up, naughty Enid Blyton heroine. I love that. I was a huge fan of Enid Blyton and all those stories from my childhood. And Trixie Belden as well, Nancy Drew, oh my gosh. But these are the American ones. In fact, some amazing digital youthification effects give Indy himself a great opening flashback section. Look, look, I love this, but also I am disappointed that Ki Hui Kwan, who played Wan Li, a.k.a. Short Round in 1984's Temple of Doom, wasn't part of the extended story of the Indiana Jones universe. Why couldn't he have been adopted by Indy and grown up to be Dr. Wan Lee Jones, you know, son of Dr. Henry Jones Jr., archaeologist, adventurer's extraordinaire? You know, that makes so much sense and it massages the senses of indie fans and respects the people, you know, and population representation. But they didn't learn from that abysmal Crystal Skull movie and they still think inside the white string. And look, look, even they say in Guardian, it is probably a bit cheeky to be giving Ford a young female co-star under this goddaughter tag with a bantering tension that is really not too different to a platonic co-star he might have had in the original movies. Short round would have been perfect now as Dr. Wanley Jones, and you know Dr. Wanley Jones could have had a daughter who could then have continued the adventures of the Jones family. Dun -dun 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 -dun. But anyway, it says here Indiana Jones still has a certain old school class. I hate the word class, it's so colonial, but I get it. Something, uh, something died with the old school. Lucky we're still alive. <laughs> we may even, uh, Dwayne and I may even spend our coin is that what people say now? Is that the cool thing to say? Spend our coin at the cinemas for this because Indy is a favorite character. And speaking of favorite characters, now up on Videofly, we have started our series of illustrated conversations and reviews about our favorite characters. We start with The Phantom, we review the movie, and I break it down for you. And going by the chuckling coming from my husband's editing space, it's, it's good. So I have to go and watch it too. See you there. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next week. Thank you.